I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this morning's webinar on uh, pitching. Before I get started on the webinar, I just wanted to make a few quick uh, points. The first is that I'll refer to uh, what we call progressive skills training, or PST, uh, as part of the webinar today. Uh, we won't go into too much detail about what PST is. If, uh, you have, if you're not familiar with PST, um, essentially looking at exercise and the, and the shape of the activity with specific focus on uh, training coordination more than uh, traditional strength conditioning. Uh, but we have a, a PST primer video uh, on our YouTube channel uh, that covers it um, in, in much more detail. So if you're not familiar with PST, uh, the stuff you're going to see today is, is very simplistic uh, visually, um, but is uh, very involved neuromechanically. So to, to better understand what it is we're talking about when we talk about PST, I would highly recommend that you watch the short PST primer where we actually go into quite a bit of detail about what PST actually is. So I'm not going to get into that too much today. Um, and then as always, if you have questions, uh, I typically don't answer questions during these webinars, but uh, you can always uh, either type them into the question box or the uh, chat box or email me directly um, and uh, I'll do my best to get back to you in a timely fashion with answers uh, to all questions. Today's webinar is on uh, uh, pitching and pitching biomechanics. Uh, the idea is that, and we've talked about this in other sports uh, and in other aspects of baseball, is that maximum output, whether it be bat speed, uh, pitching velocity, running acceleration type speed, is, a, is most effectively uh, improved or generated through efficient biomechanics. And it's through efficient biomechanics that we also reduce the risk of mechanical injury um, on the joints and on the body. The, the, certainly, there's injury potential inherent in sport, in overhand throwing and pitching. Uh, there's a lot of abnormal stress placed on the shoulder and the elbow in particular. We can't eliminate that. It's just inherent in the motion. But the more efficient our body works, the more efficient uh, we are about generating arm speed, uh, the, 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 um, the, the greater our ability to minimize the impact of that stress on the joints and also uh, minimize excessive loads uh, through compensation. So the idea here is that generating maximum speed or, or pitch velocity should go hand in hand with lowering the risk of injury. Um, and that comes through efficient biomechanics. So uh, that's going to be key is that in, in many cases we're trying to improve speed output or outcome uh, through you know gaining muscle um, maybe a little bit mobility you know working on explosive speed and power in a generic sense and then what we do is we lay that on top of um, a faulty foundation in terms of faulty coordination faulty biomechanics we almost uh, we may increase velocity a little bit, but we're almost increasing the risk of mechanical injury, uh, putting more speed, more power on top of faulty mechanics. We are going to look at this from the aspect that we want to improve coordination primarily, and in improving coordination and efficiency, improving velocity at the same time, reducing the risk of um, overuse or mechanical injury. So there's three primary keys uh, to uh, increasing velocity and maximizing efficiency, reducing the risk of injury. Uh, and these are in order of importance. Lower body drives the power process. Uh, like many, many sports, any kind of discipline acceleration activity, um, the lower body is really the key, whether it's golf, baseball, tennis. Driving the power process from the ground up is, is the key. Letting the bigger muscles and the bitter, bigger body segments do a bulk of the heavy lifting, a bulk of the, the the initial power process. Where most of us fail is we try to use our upper body and the smaller muscles, the smaller uh, body segments uh, to um, sort of control the, uh, the, uh, the uh, effort. And a as a result, we're increasing stress loads and we're going through a bunch of compensation. So the key uh, of, of the three keys, the number one key is lower body drives the power process. We're going to talk a lot about the lower body, lower body mechanics, what makes effective lower body mechanics in pitching and throwing in general, 
uh, and how that drives the process. If you can do one, most of the other things start to fall in place. So if you can do one, uh, if you can uh, utilize your lower body effectively, uh, two and three tend to fall into place with very little effort. Um, number two is that the core changes power into rotational speed. So uh, we use the lower body to drive that power process, but we use the core to control the process. So we talk about the lower body drives it, uh, the core controls it, and the extremity, in this, in the, or, you know, in this case to the arm, uh, is essentially along for the ride. We want to make sure that it's set up to be effective in terms of dynamics, but it's not doing a lot of work. It's benefiting from the work that was done in the lower body, which was then controlled and transferred through the core to the extremity itself. Now, the, the last thing as far as arm speed goes, and we'll talk about all this obviously in more detail, is that maximum arm speed is most effectively and most efficiently um, achieved through uh, shoulder internal rotation. Uh, and shoulder internal rotation goes hand in hand with elbow extension. I'm going to show you that pattern. But in the most effective uh, mechanics, it's shoulder internal rotation that is creating uh, maximum distal speed uh, and, and, and essentially ball release speed. If that's, if that's occurring, we not only are able to achieve higher velocities, but we're also minimizing the risk. Um, and again, there's risk inherent, but we're minimizing the risk of um, overload uh, uh, type mechanics on the medial aspect elbow, obviously uh, lateral aspect elbow as a result of medial stretching, um, uh, valgus overload, and then and also on the shoulder, on the capsule itself. So, uh, you know, arm speed is achieved through internal rotation mechanics and, and there's some dynamics there, but again, arm speed should be somewhat passive in that it, it feeds off of and as a derivative of the lower body driving the core controlling the arm being whipped or, or accelerated in, in almost kind of a passive way. I mean, it's not, it's not inert, it's not, it's not limp and, and passive in that nature, but it's not producing as much as it's uh, funneling speed from the ground up to the ball uh, at release. So the keys, again, are going to be lower body drives the power process, uh, the core changes that power into rotational speed, and uh, arm speed is going to be best and most efficiently achieved through shoulder internal rotation. So uh, I, I grabbed a, a picture off the internet. I wanted to, to give credit uh, to uh, this is uh, uh, Trevor Bauer, um, and uh, the photography was done by an individual called uh, by the name of Robert Steele. So I just wanted to make sure that I give credit to where the image came from. It's a really nice image, um, and it was out on the internet and uh, grabbed it because I thought it was, it was a nice breakdown of pitching mechanics. I'm not going to focus on every pitch or every uh, uh, sequence, but what I wanted to do was to basically show you. Uh, from the ground up, what's taking place during the pitching motion, okay? So what I want to show you is as we get into here, so all this kind of like pre-movement, pre getting us set up for uh, initial foot contact. Uh, at initial foot contact, the foot presses into the ground and along the surface of the ground. The ground then, the ground reaction to that is to push back with equal and opposite force that force is translated into the lead hip, which creates rotational speed at the pelvis. So as soon as the foot comes in contact with the ground, we are immediately creating a pelvic rotational speed. That's the, the sort of the crux of lower body mechanics. It's, it, you know, it's, it's the key to generating good overall dynamics. If we do this well, we're going to talk about the specifics of what that, what that all is, but if we do that well, then we're going to have for the most part, pretty good core stability, pretty good core coordination, and if we get the arm in an appropriate load uh, position uh, at foot contact, um, then we're going to have good, for the most part, good arm dynamics with very little extra effort. So lower body mechanics really becomes the foundation for this movement. So um, again, as the foot comes into contact with the ground, pushes along the surface of the ground. The ground pushes back with equal and opposite force, which is translating the hip which creates pelvic rotational speed. As the pelvis then accelerates, the core musculature is going to be stretched. The stretch response to that is a ballistic shortening. Um, and as the uh, core musculature then shortens, the upper torso is going to be accelerated. So if we move down to this picture here, the upper torso is now accelerated around the spine with rotational velocity. So we're now transferring, controlling and transferring the speed through the core 
to the upper extremity. The key to that is if that's done appropriately and the arm is in an appropriate load position, we're now going to get good arm dynamics because as you can see, as the upper torso begins to accelerate rotationally around the spine as a function of the lower body and the core passing that speed along the chain, the arm is now going into external rotation, which is loading the internal rotators at the shoulder primarily. What then happens is the upper torso decelerates to get in position to release the ball, and as the upper torso decelerates, the shoulder begins to internally rotate, and that's where that internal rotation speed comes from. As the shoulder internally rotates to ball release, the elbow extends. So you have the shoulder internally rotating, you have the elbow beginning to extend, um, and at ball release, you have the elbow in, in almost full extension with maximum internal rotation speed. And the maximum internal rotation speeds on average are you know, uh, four to 5,000 degrees per second for Major League Baseball players, and can even be higher than that with your, with your harder throwers. Um, it can be upwards of 7,000 degrees per second, uh, or um, in some cases more. But you're averaging somewhere between you know, four to 5,000 degrees per second of internal rotation speed. Um, at that point, that internal rotation speed is creating maximum ball speed or wrist speed or hand speed, and that's when the ball is uh, delivered. That's when the hand lets go of the ball, and the ball accelerates out of the hand. So momentum is then transferred, or speed is then transferred from the body to the ball as it's released and it accelerates towards the plate. So again, we've got lower body mechanics, uh, ground reaction force creating rotational speed at the pelvis, core engagement, which facilitates rotational speed of the, of the upper torso or the upper thoracic, which loads the arm. As the upper thoracic then slows down, the arm internally rotates, the elbow extends, the arm then reaches maximum internal rotation velocity at ball release, and the ball is accelerated away from the hand uh, toward the plate. What does that look like uh, biomechanically? Okay, so here, this is a, uh, a biomechanical snapshot of what we just described, only looking at just the rotational speeds of the body cycle. So what we have in this graph is degrees per second over here versus time, full contact, ball release. So in an, in an efficient movement, we'll see just after foot contact, the lower body is accelerated as a function of the ground reaction force pressing against the lead hip. The core musculature is engaged, which will decelerate the, the lower body and accelerate the upper body. So we get not only muscular activation, but we get uh, the transfer or kind of conservation of momentum, which creates a, a, a kinetic link or a whip action, like metal summation action. Um, as the... Uh, shoulder or upper torso as the uh, we call shoulder segment as the upper thoracic or upper torso accelerates the arm you can see going to negative goes into a loading dynamic so you're going to get elbow flexion and you're going to get external rotation creating a, a, a large uh, moment in loading dynamic on internal rotators of the shoulder as the upper torso or upper thoracic decelerates the arm now starts to accelerate as the arm accelerates the elbow reaches a quick extension speed as the elbow almost fully extends just prior to ball release, which just rapidly fires the, the shoulder into internal rotation, which creates maximum ball velocity and the maximum it's not, or, uh, arm velocity. And it's not just arm velocity or hand wrist velocity as the ball is being let go, but it's the momentum, the, the ex significant acceleration of the arm in internal rotation uh, at ball release is going to create not only maximum speed output, but the delivery of that speed in terms of transferring speed and momentum for the ball as the ball is being let go. So biomechanically, uh, the, the patterns of effective coordination, of effective uh, kinetic linking or segmental summation are very obvious, and we can break that down biomechanically, body segment by body segment. So let's take a look at what uh, some of the key components uh, to this process. Uh, starting with lower body mechanics. So here's some uh, basic, well, as, we, as we described before, the, the key is, is that the, the, the foot comes into contact with the ground, uh, pushing downward and along the surface of the ground. The ground reaction to that is translated into the lead hip, which is what creates rotational speed at the pelvis. Lower body dynamics are absolutely crucial. The pitch takes place in fractions of a second. From foot contact to ball release is literally fractions of a second. Uh, less than half a second of ballistic activity. So we don't have time to waste. If there's something wrong with lower body mechanics, 
um, right away, we almost eliminate lower body from participating effectively. We now have to compensate up the chain. Many, many pitchers at many, many levels, certainly kids, have a tendency to break down lower body mechanics right away. Um, but even as we move up into uh, you know, high school, college, and even your, your major league players, um, obviously they're doing it very well. But even within their context, within that scenario, uh, guys who, um, who don't use the lower bodies effectively as they might are the guys who typically end up having elbow and shoulder issues and even low back issues um, as a result of compensating. So we want to obviously maximize lower body mechanics. So here's some of the keys to, to uh, uh, lower body mechanics. Stride length is, is absolutely crucial. Here we're going to look at stride length as a percent of anatomy, as a, as a percent of the leg length. Obviously, um, uh, uh, different anatomies, some are shorter, some are taller, some have long legs, short torsos, and vice versa. So as a percentage of leg length, stride length should be about 149 or 150% of leg length, leg length from hip center to ankle. Okay, so 150 times, uh, or 150 percent. I mean, <laughs> not 150 times. 150 percent of leg length, um, essentially a leg and a half of stride length. Now, if it's too short, what happens is uh, we we compromise typically lead leg stabilization. If it's too short, you're typically landing more on the toe, um, and uh, you tend to want to go into knee flexion. Uh, and, and you don't stabilize the lead leg very well. We're going to talk about how what's important about stabilizing the lead leg is absolutely crucial after we have an appropriate stride line. Um, stride direction is going to be eight degrees close. So you know, eight degrees is very difficult to actually physically see, but the idea is, is that we're not we're certainly not striding open. All right, our, our leg shouldn't open if if we're looking at a line from the mound directly to the plate. We shouldn't be open to that line. We should be close, not too close. We want to be essentially striding directly towards the uh, the the, uh, the plate, but we want to be just a little bit close. So eight degrees close, that's important. What you'll see, especially a lot of young kids do, uh, is open open to the to the to the plate. In other words, open their hips too soon and too much, uh, and you also see them open their foot up. So the foot also is going to to stride just a little bit close, essentially pointing at the the, the plate, but just a little bit close. If we open up, then what happens is we lose the ability to push against the ground and create ground reaction force on, on the, uh, uh, the pelvis. Once we've accomplished that, the next key is that the lead knee should land at about a 45 to 50 degree angle, knee angle. And the key is not only landing at that angle, but stabilizing in that angle through the first half of acceleration. So we should see no, so what you'll typically see is Either knee flexion, where the where the individual will land at a you know roughly a, a 45 degree angle, and then go into rapid knee flexion, where the knee bends forward and they kind of bend down over their, their front leg, or you'll see them go into a rapid extension. Neither of which is good because in that case we've pretty much eliminated lower body mechanics from the equation, and we're pushing uh, uh, the demands of creating speed up the chain, which is causing compensations and breakdowns right away. So key, absolute keys to pitching or throwing in general, but certainly pitching is an appropriate stride length, an appropriate stride direction, foot position, and maybe most important of all, after we've done this, is landing on a 45 degree angle knee and stabilizing that lead leg at 45 degrees. The best pitchers land at about a 45 to 50 degree angle and stabilize all the way through to ball release, and then there's some extension. Um, we don't want that extension to occur early. So what's absolutely crucial to, to uh, uh, lower body mechanics, lower body power, and pitching in general is appropriate lower body mechanics, um, starting with uh, the foot coming in contact with the ground, the knee at a 45 degree angle, stabilizing that uh, lead knee, and forcing uh, the ground reaction force into the lead hip to create rotational speed. Um, another very common uh, breakdown you'll see, and you actually see it in, in if you look, if you remember when we looked through the sequence of this, you see uh, uh, pitchers probably more often than not landing on their heel where their toes up in the air, rather than landing on the ball of their foot where their foot's coming into solid contact with the ground on, uh, on initial contact. What happens when they land on their heel is that for the first uh, instant or two, the foot then has to come into contact with the ground, and when that occurs, we're losing the ability to push against the ground, create 
rotational speed of the pelvis. So in the time that it takes the foot to come in contact with the ground, we bypass the lower body mechanics. So we, again, push the stress of, of creating speed up the chain. I want to go back to this picture and I'll show you. Here in this picture, we see this happening. The toe is up in the air, landing on the heel, and then from here to here, it takes that amount of time, which is absolutely crucial time, to um, that time where the lower body should be accelerating uh, to, um, uh, to, to get the foot flat to the ground where now we can push it against the ground effectively. So this already visually, we, can, we don't need, we even need our 3D biomechanics to assess that that's a problem. And even with a high level picture, um, that's, gonna, that's going to impact uh, consistency, ball velocity, but most importantly, stress on the arm, stress on the joints. Um, the other thing that happens, now in this case, we don't see it because this is a high level picture, but in this case, we don't see it, but most often than not, when you land on the heel, you also cannot stabilize the lead leg very effectively, hence you, you lose the ability to use the lower body almost you know, immediately. So again, that's going to be crucial. So if we just kind of quickly summarize again, stride length is about 150% um, uh, leg length from hip to ankle. Stride direction is a little bit closed. Uh, and the lead leg should land at about a 45 degree angle. So if this is zero, this is 90, we want that lead leg at about 45 degrees, uh, 45 to 50, it can be a little bit straighter. And then um, we want to stabilize that lead leg, stable, uh, lead, leg uh, lead knee, I should say, throughout the, the, the bulk of the acceleration of the arm so that we have good lower body acceleration and good stability and good platform. Um, and the key then is to land on the ball of the foot, not the toe, and not the heel, but make sure that the, the foot's coming into full contact with the ground upon uh, initial contact with the ground and not the heel or the toe so that we have to wait for it to get uh, into contact with the ground. So we talked about PST. Obviously, you're going you're gonna to work on your, your uh, uh, pitching mechanics. Obviously, uh, you're going to work on your strength and conditioning, uh, strength, mobility, and power. But in order to, to get effective uh, correlation between your physical ability and what you're trying to do with your technique, we need to make sure that the body is sequencing and coordinating in an effective way. PST, the main focus of progressive skills training, is using exercise concepts um, blended with technique and activity-specific motion to train coordination and pattern, not to train the, 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 the technique and not to do the strength and conditioning, but to train the coordination that sort of glues the two together. So here's a very simple, and then there's many, many variations, and, and the, the idea behind progressive skills training is that it's progressive, that we start with simple movements, make sure we can do, it's sort of like taking baby steps, you know, actually, we, if you look at the pre-SD primer, we talk about just being able to turn over, hold your head up, crawl before you can stand up, take your first steps, walk, run, you know, there's, there's a progression of things that need to take place. So we start slow with small, small little units of movement, perfect those units of movement, and then link them together into more complex units of movement, uh, and then eventually into the activity itself. So here's a very simple, simple PSP, but it's highly effective. You'd be surprised at how many athletes cannot do it effectively, <clears throat> uh, even at higher levels. And what we're going to do is we just call it stride forward, so stride to landing. We're going to get in a balanced position. So we're going to get uh, um, balanced on our, our post leg. We're going to bring our knee up into essentially a, a sort of a wind-up position. And we're going to get in our essentially our balanced ready position. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fall forward to land on our foot, on the ball of our foot or on the, on the hole of our foot with a lead leg at a 45-degree angle with our shoulders in our 90-90 load position. If we can practice doing this over and over again. Now, obviously, doing this uh, slow and on a flat, we're not going to get 150% um, uh, leg length in terms of our stride. But what we're doing is we're teaching the body to stay stable from a, a spine perspective. We have a good platform. We're landing in the ball or the hole of our foot, and we're landing on a 45-degree angle in a ready load position. So. It's a very simple exercise. It, you know, it's one of those things that can be done uh, and is typically done, uh, even as, as a function of teaching kids how to, how to pitch or you know, uh, teaching mechanics. But we want to use it as an exercise. So we want to do it in progression with other exercises as a part of lower body training. So this is essentially lower body training, very simplistic to begin with, but then there's things that we can do to make this more involved and more dynamic and actually then start to build 
lower body speed dynamics off of these types of exercises. But here's one that uh, if you're teaching a young kid how to pitch or you're, you're taking someone who, you know, at high school level or junior high level who is, or even college level for that matter, you know, minor league level, who's throwing hard, but you can clearly see that they're landing on their heel and that their knee is flexing and then extending or extending immediately and not stabilizing, this exercise will go a long way to giving them First, the feel, the proprioceptive awareness of what that feels like, to land on the whole of their foot at a 45-degree angle, stabilizing the spine, and being ready to load the, load the arm dynamically. But you'll also train the neuromechanical pattern. So here's a simple way to start to uh, embed that pattern into the movement. So the next thing is, is that, as we just explained earlier, was that the lower body accelerates triggers a core muscular reaction which then accelerates the upper body which allows the arm to be effectively loaded as we see here and allows us to not only create muscular activation which is going to create power but also sequencing in a way that allows us to segmentally summate speed so we get that whip action that crack the whip action where where momentum is being transferred and conserved um, and as that is occurring we're exponentially increasing body segment velocity uh, the core should be loaded uh, 40 degrees. Um, and what we need from the core is not only the, the separation, but the contraction and the stretch shortened pattern. We need the, the, uh, the lower body to act as an anchor. We need the upper body to be accelerated. So we need this idea of differentiation or dissociation to occur between the lower body and the upper body. This is the same essential uh, dissociation pattern that we have um, in virtually every distal end acceleration activity, whether it's uh, some variation of throwing or some variation of swinging. But again, each one is a little different. A, a, a tennis serve is going to be a little different from a baseball throw, which is going to be a little different from a, a baseball swing or a golf swing. We want to put it in the context of the, of the action itself. But what's very important, and we're, the next area that most people are breaking down and throwing after the lower body is segmentally coordinating through the torso. They, they screw up that coordination. The upper body goes before the lower body. There's a lot of compensation. They don't load the arm very effectively. And then not only are they losing velocity, but they're stressing the, the uh, medial aspect, elbow, and the shoulder um, by trying to force that dynamic rather than letting it flow more naturally. So here's a, a really basic, again, very basic exercise, uh, again, PST-related uh, exercise, where we start in that land position that we took from the last exercise. And we hold the lower body still while up accelerating the upper body forward. It's a small range of motion activity, but what it's doing is, is stretching and contracting the core in sequence. Now, we're not moving the lower body yet. We'll, we'll, we can gradually build into more dynamic patterning. But this ability to stay stable, move our body segment coordination, or move our, or coordinate our upper torso in particular around the spine, perpendicular to the spine, not bending and shearing the spine and then leaning over and kind of, you know, pulling the arm across our chest, but working perpendicular to our spine. Once we're comfortable anchoring, engaging, and working perpendicular, then we can, the, the spine angle can change a lot and our body's used to working perpendicular. If we just start by kind of leaning and posting and pulling the arm across our chest, we never get comfortable with engaging the core musculature and using the lower body uh, from a ground up kind of sequencing perspective. So here's a very simple exercise it's called Torso Connect. It's just a bunch of repetitions of uh, essentially core connected. I mean, you can do this uh, away from this act activity doing you know, little Russian twists or any kind of rotational dynamic exercise, but this puts us in the context of a pitch motion of, of pitch sequencing, and then we take this and build on it to make it more and more dynamic. We can use uh, variations of med ball or file ball, just all kinds of different things once we've established this pattern. The, uh, the next thing, uh, again, that we'll talk about uh, in terms of training is, then is uh, um, arm dynamic. So what happens, again, is that the, as the upper torso accelerates, the arm is essentially in a 90-degree position and the, the shoulder goes into external rotation. That loads the internal rotators. As the shoulders, uh, or as the upper torso then decelerates, the shoulder will then internally rotate and accelerate towards release. As that, that occurs, the elbow quickly extends. So you can see the elbow extending, which facilitates 
a really rapid internal rotation, and that occurs right here as the ball is being released. So what I want to I want to I want to show if I see me to draw here um, on the side here or here at the bottom is think of it this way. This is we're going to let's look at a right-handed pitcher. Okay, here's here's our shoulder, here's our elbow holding the baseball here. What's happening here is in this in this sequence here as the shoulder is being loaded is the arm should be in roughly a 90-90 position, 90 degrees of of abduction and 90 degrees of elbow flexion. The reason being is that as the shoulder's upper torso accelerates this way, the, the arm just rapidly moved it or, or forced into external rotation about the shoulder. We want maximum load to occur on the internal rotators, and as a result, or, or as a function of that, we want the largest moment arm. So the, uh, if the arm is in a 90 degree bed, roughly, we have the largest lever arm here, so the largest amount of torque or moment being created, which is going to load the shoulder most effectively. The other thing about this is that if this occurs, then the arm is going to start to go into supination, but then quickly, or the forearm, I should say, going into the supination, quickly followed by pronation. If that occurs in this position, then the act of going from supination to pronation is going to um, tighten the, uh, the pronators across the medial aspect of the elbow and protect the elbow more effectively. If we don't have this dynamic, the, the forearm tends to go into supination too long, and then we don't get as much protection on the medial aspect elbow as we transition from load to acceleration. So it's important. Now what happens then is as the shoulder now starts to go into internal rotation in this direction is, there's, there's a massive lever arm to overcome. So we're not going to create a whole lot of speed. So what the body then naturally does is extends the elbow to release the ball from out here. As that occurs, we minimize the lever arm dramatically almost, you know, in, the, in literally milliseconds of time, we're going to get and that's this action here. When that occurs and the lever arm and the moment of inertia decreases dramatically, we get a huge spike and acceleration in internal rotation velocity. So the combination and sequencing of going into a 90-90 load position and then going into um, uh, extension internal rotation, that pattern uh, is absolutely crucial to creating velocity and protecting the arm. And so, and that doesn't mean you're, you're free from stress because you're not. I mean, the, the, the throwing mechanic is going to create high stress loads on the elbow and the shoulder. There's no way you get around it. We want to minimize, you know, the uh, the stress and try to protect the, the joint as much as we can. So the idea here is that that's maximizing that effort of protecting the joints, not eliminating stress all, altogether. But if we can do that pattern, we're going to have the greatest efficiency. Now that is done quote unquote passively. It's not done uh, as the primary speed developer, which are, a lot of kids are, or a lot of you know, uh, athletes are throwing with their arms. We want to accelerate the arm by throwing with our legs and our core and accelerate the arm. Um, if that's done in a more relaxed, pliable way, the arm is going to achieve far greater speed. So the sequence and that more passive, relaxed, pliable nature is going to create maximum arm speed. So uh, the last exercise I'll, I'll show you before we kind of summarize here um, is a, a, a PNF five or a kind of a, a single arm chop lift kind of pattern that where we go from just standing straight, we just go from a 90-90 position. In this case, what you're going to do is you're going to externally rotate the shoulder. You're going to abduct into 90, you're going to bend the elbow into 90, and you're going to supinate the wrist. So the thumb goes uh, uh, open, and we're supinating the forearm, really. Okay, so we're in a 90-90, really a 90-90-90, but we're in a 90-90 position here, um, and uh, we're uh, supinating the wrist. We then, enter, as we go in this diagonal pattern, we're, going, we're internally rotating the shoulder, we're extending the elbow and we're pronating the forearm. So now thumb goes down, and we're and then we can come back from that pro, this position back up to this position and repeat the pattern, taking us through both load and acceleration, teaching the arm to work more effectively uh, in in sequence. As we're internally rotating, we should be extending the elbow and and pronating forearm. That's going to allow us to get maximum velocity and the the, the greatest protection of the joints. Um, uh, through, uh, especially at the elbow, through protecting uh, the, the medial aspect elbow as we engage the pronators. So this is a very simple pattern 
um, you know, guys way back in the day, there's many, many guys, but, you know, Ken Wilk and ASMI, you know, they were doing this 20-plus years ago with their athletes, and there's many variations to do it. It's absolutely crucial. They're doing a little bit more in terms of strengthening and rehab. We try to group it in to uh, a combination of, of activities that's more coordination training based. And then what we do is we get more uh, dynamic with this and we start working at speeds and, and uh, you know, plyometrically and, and so, so on and so forth, but as a function of coordination training more than rehab or strength and conditioning. Okay, so here's the take home. There's a lot of information that we give in these webinars. I, I try to keep it as, as simple as possible, but it's hard to not get somewhat technical. And I know some people are techno junkies, but a lot of people just, you know, don't want to be overloaded with information. I think that you have to have enough understanding so that you're, you're getting the whole picture. So, you know, there's going to be some technical information, obviously, in these webinars. But if there's some real key take-homes, it's these two things. Lower body mechanics, the key, the key and you can do this very simply, land on the ball of your foot, land at a 45 degree angle, and then stabilize that, that lead knee angle. Don't allow it to either extend or flex. So those two are absolutely key. You can do that uh, with anybody. You can visually see how they do it just by watching or, or taking some basic video. Um, that is absolutely crucial. It's crucial when you're teaching young kids how to throw. I have a, a seven year, or just turned eight year old daughter who's played softball in a couple years, and we work on throwing dynamics by landing it, whether you're throwing flat as a position player or as a pitcher, landing on the, the, the hole of the foot, the ball of the foot, 45 degree knee angle, and stabilizing as you accelerate through the core. Good platform for movement. That's a take home. That's absolute, got to do it. Uh, if you can work on this at all, you're going to be a much better athlete, throw harder, and protect the, uh, the joints uh, much more effectively. Then the next thing is arm dynamics. The arm is more passive and whipped. It's pliable in nature. We don't want the arm producing speed. It's, it's real obvious to see the young kids uh, who throw. They throw uh, almost all upper body, all arm. You can just see it as they throw. It's less obvious with the, the, the higher level athlete because they've learned the sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of the mechanics and the, di the sort of the superficial dynamics of it. But um, in many, many cases, even your higher level athletes um, are not using lower body effectively and, and use too much of the extremity to create speed. And that's going to impact velocity, but more importantly, impact the stress. 90-90 low position. You know, that's been around forever. I, mean, I, I started my, my career back at ASMI. Um, and uh, they, they, you know, they've been doing wonderful baseball stuff forever. And even back then, you know, the, the idea of not pushing and losing your stability and landing in that in a nice triangle base, you know, that's all this stuff. And then that 90-90 load. Is every athlete going to be perfectly 90-90? No. But the reason for that is you want a lever arm to create internal rotation um, uh, or, or internal rotator load that facilitates appropriate internal rotation. And if you start off this way, it, during the dynamics of throwing, you're going to go into internal rotation extension more effectively. It's when you get the arm too low, too high, you get the, too, too much bend or too little bend, and then the, the dynamics are all screwed up, and then you're compensating right away. So 90-90 load position, soft, not, not, not inert or limp, but soft, pliable arm, 90-90 load position, and remember that speed is created through internal rotation speed uh, or, or internal rotation velocity. And it's and it's uh, not something that you can force to happen, but if you do these two things, it will naturally occur with a little bit of extra training and, you know, kind of coaxing. These things kind of take care of themselves if we put the athlete in the right positions and then train the right sequences, these things take place. So, uh, the, again, the take-home, lower body mechanics, land on the hole or the ball of your foot at a 45-degree knee angle, then stabilize that lead knee angle, uh, let the arm be more passive, I should say passive, but more pliable, that's a better way to put it. Uh, and when the foot comes into contact with the ground, as close to a 90-90 load position as possible. The last thing that I'll kind of finish up with is, um, obviously, you know, you can affect some of this stuff visually, but ultimately, uh, the availability of um, motion uh, uh, capture technology and the ability to create 3D representations and calculate things like I showed you, the kinetic link. Literally take a look at how effective the, the body is in creating momentum and transferring momentum. The speeds and coordination of those speeds is absolutely crucial. 
this kind of stuff is now available. Uh, used to only be research labs and maybe some few high-end uh, uh, Major League Baseball organizations that had access to this. Now it's becoming more and more acceptable. Um, it's it's like you know it, it'd be like trying to function without MRI and CAT scan. You know, um, once that technology is made available, it, it, it provides a whole other level of of, of uh, diagnostic capability. So. Uh, we would suggest that you use uh, a, a 3D motion test like Xenolink to actually look at the biomechanics, the dynamics of lead weight stability, the dynamics of ground reaction force, uh, pelvic rotational speed, objectively and quanti quantitatively uh, assess the effectiveness of low biomechanics. Assess the effectiveness of core stability and core coordination. That's something you absolutely can't see with the eyes. Um, where lead weight stabilization, you can start to see some of that stuff. Core stability and coordination is just impossible to actually see and quantify. Uh, obviously, correct segmental, segmental sequencing, the whole kinetic link, that's impossible to see. We need to be able to quantify that. Uh, and then arm mechanics, elbow extension, shoulder to rotation, looking at that dynamically, the sequencing, breaking it down, the actual speeds, the actual coordination of it, absolutely crucial. From that kind of a diagnostic, we can uh, create very customized, very in, in, individualized programs uh, in particular, uh, PST or, or uh, progressive skills training programs that augment what they're what the athletes doing with their coach and what augment what they're doing with their therapist and their trainer to build a better segmental coordination, which is really going to be at I think the 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 core of improving uh, uh, pitching velocity as well as minimizing the risk of of um, uh, mechanical injury or overload injury by maximizing efficiency and keeping the arm in more appropriate positions during high stress levels. So, uh, you know, in summary, there's a lot of data here. The take home is lower body mechanics and arm dynamics. Um, if you have any specific questions, you know, and if you haven't, uh, you know, uh, uh, input of them, you can always uh, send me an email um, and I'll uh, answer questions, uh, like I said, is, is, um, in, a, in a, a timely fashion as I can. Um, but uh, again, the, the take home in almost all these is lower body mechanics driving the power process, core uh, uh, controlling that power, and the extremities being more pliable and and really being more uh, more passive to the to the experience rather than being the primary uh, focus of power generation. I appreciate you guys uh, 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 joining our webinar today. And uh, if you missed uh, base stealing and hitting, those are on YouTube. This will be on YouTube. Uh, uh, by tomorrow, um, and I think we're going to, to move on to uh, talk just about some other sports and also talk about off-season training programs for summer sports like baseball and how we can maximize our off-season uh, to build not only strength mobility um, but also uh, pr more appropriate coordination so that by the spring uh, the athletes are uh, uh, really ready to hit the ground running uh, with uh, tryouts and, and spring practices and obviously getting into their season not only physically fit but uh, way more coordinated and way more effective about the motion itself. So we'll, we'll start some of those webinars uh, next week and we'll get into off-season stuff and some of the other sports here soon. I again appreciate you uh, joining us today and, and hopefully uh, got something out of it. Um, again, if you have questions, uh, just uh, email me um, or uh, post them to, uh, to the uh, question section of the webinar. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.